Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today who is helping to create and inspire a better tomorrow for everyone. Um, today, we have the honor of being joined by Beth Bell, uh, who is, among other things, an author, uh, an advisor, an entrepreneur, and has really been on quite a bit of a journey of spiritual awakening as of late. Uh, Beth started out as a, a rising sales star turned marketing executive uh, in the pharma industry, spending uh, more than 16 years at Bayer, uh, leading uh, strategic brand planning and, and various other functions in both female health uh, and contraception. Uh, however, she says somewhere between C-level meetings and, and marketplace assessments and so forth, um, she began listening to the world around her a little differently and within her uh, and found that maybe Big Pharma wasn't <laughs> exactly what she wanted to be doing in the long term. Ultimately, by listening to herself and to the world, she uh, ultimately led her to, to ditch this corporate life and ultimately pursue uh, a life's purpose of, as she says, pollinating the planet with love, which is interestingly a title of one of her uh, many books, uh, Flower Power for Pure Love. Uh, as her inward journey deepened, um, Beth became known as the Flower Whisperer, and she forged all sorts of new paths, first as an entrepreneur, uh, designing silver jewelry in Bali, uh, then she became a radio and TV uh, show host and author, and uh, currently she um, is involved in, in as she said, a multidimensional advisor for chief executive officers and uh, various psychedelic pharmaceutical companies through her organization, Psychedelic Sages, and as I mentioned, she is a uh, a quite accomplished author with other titles, including uh, The Awakening and Healing Handbook, uh, Five Pearls of Wisdom Workbook, Savvy Insider Guide to Abud Bali, and her new book uh, out documenting her amazing journey, uh, Angels, uh, Herpes and Psychedelics, Unraveling the Mind to Unveil uh, Illusions. Um, a lot of really interesting and exciting themes to get into today. Uh, we're honored to have her. Uh, Beth Bell, a welcome to our show today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. It's it's great to have you. I um I, I really like to start things off because you know as we were chatting before this show, I um, mentioned that we we both have a little bit of a background in pharma. You you spent a little more time in big pharma than I did, but I was sort of uh, been on the periphery and services and biotech and things like that. Um, talk a little bit about yourself, if you would, for sort of the the early part of this uh, before the journey begins. A, a little bit of. Uh, where you grew up, how you got into the pharma industry, and, and a little bit what you're doing those uh, sort of decade and a half in big pharma that uh, you liked at one point, but then you realized at some point this wasn't exactly uh, you know, the big picture <laughs> that Beth Bell wanted to see in the world. Well, I like to tell really long stories, so I'm going to try to zip up my early years to say that I grew up in a town of 2,500 people, super small, knew everybody. Uh, just learned so much about community and respect for elders. And I wouldn't take that upbringing um, away for anything in the world. It was like the most amazing opportunity, I think, as a child to be part of a community like that. So, but I was so happy to get out of North Dakota and escape a <laughs> small town. So there's lots of good and, and, uh, and there's some downsides to it. And I was just always excited about opportunity in life. And so eventually, uh, I, well, I studied architecture and, and I had done an architectural internship in California. And so early on, I mean, fresh out of the womb, I was pretty, I was pretty, pretty adventurous and wanted to, uh, to seek all of what life had to offer. So. 
I spent some time in California, and that's really where I started in the pharmaceutical industry as a sales rep. Um, absolutely loved it. I was in uh, arrhythmia and multiple sclerosis, uh, our totally different division, and said I would never, uh, n- never go to New Jersey or live in New Jersey because I was loving the the lifestyle of my California, um, you know, my California lifestyle at the time. And then, as you know from the book, there's uh, several nevers that I said I would never do that I've now done except for one. And, uh, and so that never of not moving to New Jersey came true. And it was one of the best moves that I made. Um, I, I moved there with, with my husband at the time and yeah, and had this incredible opportunity to be in, uh, marketing. And that was really where I felt like my passion was. And, and I loved the strategy and, and I have to be honest, as I fast forward through, um, that time in my life, when I left, I didn't actually leave because I was disgruntled and I'm, and I didn't actually leave because I dislike big pharma. There's elements of big pharma that I think are, are not so great, but I believe in personal choice and freedom. And, and so I think that we are all called to, to figure out what's right for us, what's right for our health. And anybody in every sector is going to market to you. So people who are like a little bit soured on big pharma, um, hey, you've got a choice. And that's the beauty of freedom. And so I think, yeah, I don't have a negative um, view of pharma. Um, I think I think the science and um, everything that they do is is has a lot to be to be honored although yes there's a lot of marketing and um and as individuals we need to see through that and figure out what's right for us so i'm much more of a non pharma person for me personally i don't take any medications um i'm i'm more natural so anybody that knows me today would say i do not believe that you ever worked in big pharma and mm-hmm. anybody who knew me from big pharma would be like and you're doing what <laughs> today so it's kind of an interesting dichotomy, and I, I actually quite enjoy it. Um, and I just feel like Big Pharma gave me so much opportunity, just self-development and and lots of things. So I could go on and on about my love for my career. Um, I could go on and on about the downfalls of Big Pharma. Um, but yeah, I just I think that there's so many beautiful, beautiful opportunities that that we have in life, and that's where we need to focus our time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, I, I had the same uh experience myself I'm, I'm more of a natural guy I, I went into actually natural products after big pharma for yeah. a little while and so yeah there's all the sort of both sides of that equation but um yeah and so Beth, you, you take the reader on a, a really fascinating journey um from places like new york costa rica india bali um and, you know, you go through some highs, you go through a lot of lows, you're meeting people, you're falling in and out of love. And along the way, you mentioned, um, I forget what chapters are sort of earlier on in the book, as you're traveling, you um, you start studying uh, various sort of esoteric concepts from the world of, of physics. Uh, you, you start reading about quantum physics. You start reading about holographic universes. I read all those books too. I, you know, I, I was into that stuff as well. Well, I always found it kind of, you know, when you're dealing with things at the Planck scale, you're dealing at things light years away and so forth, hard to really wrap your head around. I mean, I know Einstein had a problem on just <laughs> thinking about it as well, so I don't feel that bad. Talk a little about some of the things that as you were on that initial journey before and before we get the flowers and psychedelics and so forth, what, what, what were some of the things that you were reaching out to? What were some of the, uh, the concepts, some of the areas that you were trying to find meaning initially as you started off on this journey? Well, I think, you know, as you read in the very first few chapters, it was really the awakening kiss at 30,000 feet that woke me up. It was just, I, I just woke up in such a different way. And I think the, the, the feeling that I had and the connection that I had to someone who I didn't really know, um, prompted me to ask a lot of questions about connection and connection between people. And I hadn't explored previous lives or any of that. I mean, I grew up Lutheran, like we didn't talk about any of that stuff. And so that catapulted me because I knew that that individual was in my life for a really 
big reason. And it wasn't necessarily that it was going to be the happily ever after romantic love story. Although of course I wish that it was, um, but yeah, I just knew. And so that's what honestly started catapulting me. And just as that character went out, cause as you know, from reading the book, um, I, we, we create our own life and our own play with our own characters. And as soon as that character went out, uh, I had called another character in somewhat unknowingly, which was uh, a teacher in A Course in Miracles. And so as science-based as I was and, you know, clinical data driven as I was, that individual came in and had just a real influence on, hey, maybe there's another way to look at the world. Yep. And so as I started reading A Course in Miracles and I started reading quantum physics, um, I don't remember exactly how I stepped into that because I'll be honest, I like quantum physics wasn't really ever in my wheelhouse. And so I was personally fascinated that I was like reading this. I just couldn't get enough. And that's where I just felt my soul was quickening. Like my soul was saying, you know, take this in, take this in, understand concepts, expand your consciousness, understand life differently, understand the unseen, you know? And so whether that came through love or that came through alignments or whatever, it just seemed like it was like on fire for me. I was ordering books like crazy. And mind you, I read a lot for work. So I never read at night. Like if I picked up a book before, I, you know, like before I went to sleep or in, you know, at some quiet time, I just fall asleep. So the fact that now all of a sudden my soul's quickening, I'm reading all these books, I'm ordering hundreds of books from at the time it was from Hay House and just taking it all in. And it just kept building. It was like, the more I understood the deeper I kind of went into this beautiful space of understanding. And look, I could we I could read a lot of those quantum physics books over today and and learn so much more because it is difficult in many ways to comprehend with our our mind exactly, yeah, what is what is going on? You know, we, we can believe it, but we don't necessarily know it or embody it, um, probably for quite some time on our journey. So so yeah, I would say it's the awakening kiss. I would say it's a course in miracles and and meeting up with Axel and having him really help uh, lead the way for me at a time where I wasn't really that open. I mean, I was spiritual, but I wasn't really yeah. I wasn't. I, the last thing I wanted to do is sort of be deemed as some kind of a hippie or and there's nothing wrong with that. But I I just that wasn't me. Like I didn't want to be in Birkenstocks and you know I still love my high heel shoes and, and 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 jewels. So yeah, it was an interesting time in my life to to be you know in both both planes at the same time. But one of the areas, um, you know, unlike the quantum world uh, or the holographic universe or whatever, one thing you, you were allowed to observe and you took it all in, I think it was on a, the beach in Bali somewhere when you were staying down that way, uh, were the flowers. And uh, as you said, uh, uh, you, your observations, uh, through those observations, messages came as they danced with the sun and the rain and gave you uh, an understanding of more of what you say going with the flow means uh, in, in sort of a cosmic sense. Talk a little bit about your your adventures in Bali and setting up the boutique and a little bit of the impact because I I love the natural world as well and I, I have extreme reverence once again for being in sort of the the natural product space we have these these couple hundred thousand species out here of plants and trees and so forth that have occupied this planet for a billion years and survived ice ages and and all sorts of other things um, a lot to teach us uh, not just for human health but uh, maybe how to live talk a little bit about your experiences in Bali and, and sort of what you began to understand and learn from the flowers yeah, well, thank you for asking that because to be honest, a lot of people kind of avoid that flower whisperer thing. They're like, that just sounds way too out there and and yet they're intrigued by it. So the flower whispering part actually started um, back around the same time that I was studying A Course in Miracles, simply that I was photographing flowers. And it was sort of, I always say a sneaky way for the universe to get me to meditate because I wanted to meditate. I really did. But in those 15 minutes, I would be like, how much more could I have gotten done off my to-do list, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just, I couldn't quiet my mind. I just, I just had so much happening and going on and I didn't have a guess that deep intrinsic desire. And yet I knew that I wanted to meditate. And so the universe gave me a camera. Uh, I started photographing flowers actually in Hawaii. Um, and then through my corporate life, when I was still in that, I was just photographing flowers a lot. And I realized, oh, I actually feel really peaceful. And I just had this draw. It was like the flowers just drew me in. You know, I would be walking and 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 I carried my camera. And at that time, our iPhones weren't like they are today. So 
I carried quite a large cool pics camera around with me like all the time, even even with work, which was a little bit strange, but you know, on my personal time, not necessarily into a meeting. But um, and I would just stop because the flowers just felt like they were calling me in. And at that time, I just innocently was photographing flowers. And then as as my journey progressed, and when I was in Bali, which was just mother nature on steroids. Yeah. Um, I started to realize, oh, when my mind quiets, I'm getting messages from the flowers. Now, honestly, it's messages from my higher self, but it felt like I was really getting messages from the flowers. And in a way you are, because you're tuning into a frequency of mother nature that gets you into another dimensional space and an expanded state of consciousness, because we know that an acorn knows to grow up to be an oak tree. And there's an intelligence behind that. And yet, in the Western world, especially, we oftentimes ignore that Mother Nature is right in front of us, right below us, right above us, right around us, you know, teaching us, helping us, wanting to heal us. And yet we just ignore it. And we just don't even stop to smell the roses. We all know that phrase, right? So one day I was actually back in California visiting and I was I was at the Self-Realization and Fellowship Garden where there's all these beautiful flowers. And I just happened to mention to my friend, I was like, oh yeah, I said, you know, and this flower is saying this and this flower is saying that. And she's like, oh my gosh, like you need to share this. And I was like, well, really, do I need to? And she's like, yeah, just put it on Instagram. So I started posting, you know, what the flowers were saying. And then I just realized that it was just my divine portal. It was just for me, it was my connection. You know, honestly, for a surfer, it's it's the surf, it's the ocean, it's getting out there. For for you know, somebody that loves the mountains, it's it's getting out in the mountains and going camping and and having that hot cup of tea, you know, in the in the brisk morning air. But that's connection to nature. And so however people go about finding it, um, when you do it's just super magical. And then you realize how much you actually don't know because you're using your intellectual mind yep. as opposed to your deep soul and inner knowing that mother nature reminds you of. So yeah. And then that just, you know, the flowers have been catapulting me and inspiring me, you know, from everything to, to all the products that I created, um, to the store in, in Bali called Blossom Bliss, um, you know, because Bliss was is actually an acronym um, that stands for beautiful, long-lasting, irreplaceable, spiritual, and still, because nice. I felt like relationships with people and relationships with flowers brought me bliss, right? That that's really what life is all about, is to be in this this blissful state as best we can, or at least get back to it if we get knocked off of it. So yeah, so Mother Nature is just an amazing, amazing thing that I think is underestimated by so many people because we're just too busy. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting hearing you talk about it this way because uh, you know one of the people that uh, that I've had on the show is uh, is Dr. Dennis Dennis McKenna of uh, of mushroom, magic mushroom fame and so forth, and he like like you do he he refers to whether it's the mushrooms or the uh, the plants the cacti whatever as as teachers you know the, his plant teachers sure. his fungal teachers uh and that we just have so much if we if we're willing to listen as you, you listen to the flowers uh if we're willing to listen to nature we can we can learn so much and you know uh he went on his psychedelic journey uh, over the years and has documented it and, and now you've documented yours uh in the new book um initially um MDMA, but then you, you know, uh, you, you went sort of to the, I'll call it the shotgun end of things to the, uh, uh, the methyl, uh, O-methyl but uh, the, uh, psychedelic of the tryptamine class derived from certain, uh, plant species, but also found in, uh, the secretory glands of certain toads. Uh, and I've never tried this one in, in my, myself, but I understand it's sort of like being shot out of a cannon in, in many ways. Um, Talk a little bit about you know all your psychedelic experiences. You know, you you know, were you scared initially? You know, what was uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you had a lot, a lot of psychedelic experience before that, but uh, what were some of the things that you found on this journey? Where you went, and a little bit of and I can you know I, I tell the the, to the toad thing from what I understand, he sort of melts you away, melts the ego apart, um, and rebuilds you. Uh, talk a little bit about that one in, in detail, if you would. Yeah, I'll, I will, and. Uh, so just answer your first question, which is like, how did I get into this? Because I am an absolute no drug person. I have always had an absolute no drug policy, even cannabis 
I, if it ever showed up, I was, I was gone. Um, I, yeah, I just had a real judgment, um, and belief around drugs as a whole. So, um, yeah, I was a pretty straight and narrow type of person. I took a lot of risks. I did a lot of adventurous things, but when it came to drugs or anything that altered the mind, I, it was an absolute no go. So that's why it's so weird and ironic that here I am today, you know, writing a book and I've got psychedelics on the cover and I feel I am actually a spokesperson for plant-based medicines. So how it happened actually was I didn't and still haven't done MDMA. My friend had done it because she was oh uh, diagnosed with cancer. Duh. And she had said to me, you know, maybe you should try this. And I, honestly, I thought to myself, I have done so much spiritual work. Like, I do not want to mess this up. Like, I am not going to do this stuff, right? Like, I don't need to. I felt quite peaceful. I felt I felt quite knowingness. Um, you know, I had my connection to flowers. And so I wasn't really that open to it, but, but I like to stay open to anything, right? So mm -hmm. note to self, back of the mind. Um, and then I was interviewing Louis Schwartzberg, who has done the fantastic fungi uh, yep. documentary. And he's just a, an incredible time-lapsed cinematographer that captures the flowers, you know, and the openings. And so I was super excited to talk to him all about the flowers, being a flower whisperer. And he was excited to talk about that too, but he wanted to talk about mushrooms, right? He had just, yeah. you know, launched the documentary. And so I was happy to talk about that. I learned so much the mycelium network and, oh my goodness, like my, my mind just expanded more. And, and so then I said, well, tell me, you know, what you think about ayahuasca and San Pedro. And so he said, look, if you get an opportunity in the right set and setting, you should absolutely do it. So I was like, okay, note to self, you know, another note in the back. And then my, my friend offered to me, she said, you know, safe set and setting my friend's doing a san pedro ceremony um you know are you interested and i still was like my first response was no um i just felt like no i'm just that's not it well it just so happened you know how the universe aligns things in mysterious ways i was editing my episode with louis and heard him say yet again with just purity and guidance uh you should try them so i thought you know it's san pedro it's a cactus. I know the power of flowers. Why am I? Why do I have this judgment against the power of plants? And I had also interviewed an amazing individual, John Steele, who is all about the soul of plants. And after my interview with him, I felt very inspired that yes, I need to be an ambassador. I'm not need to be, but like that I would call, be called to be an ambassador for flowers and plants, right? And so here I was sitting here with like this opportunity. And then I went, well, duh, of course I should try this. I I mean, I before the ceremony, I had gone out to the, the temple. I had vetted the, the the people serving, you know, like I, and, and I knew them through my friend. So I went through a whole process. You know, I didn't just like sign up overnight and like go the next day. For me, I needed to do that level of discernment and vetting. I do encourage others to do that as well for lots mm -hmm. of reasons. We can talk about. Sure. Um, and so I did that first journey on San Pedro and I had an amazing, amazing journey um, for people who are worried about, you know, purging a lot. I think most people did. I didn't. It's not a judgment. It's not good or bad. I just think that for me, I purged it out the other way um, the next day. And mm -hmm. so it was beautiful. It absolutely healed my, my gut. I had a severe um, bacteria that takes like multiple, uh, multiple, um, what do you call them? Not penicillin, but the uh, antibiotics to, yep. to heal. And I just did not want to do that to my gut. And I wasn't expecting to get that as a benefit coming out of San Pedro, but I went in and I said to my, my, my doctor, I said, before, before we go to that, that really extreme regimen of antibiotics, can, can we test me again? Cause I just, I feel like I've healed it. And sure enough, it was gone. Mm -hmm. Right. And she's like, that's not possible. And I'm like, it's possible. <laughs> it happened. <laughs> Um, but there was also a lot of really soft, gentle things that happened for me that I think just gave me that feeling of, oh, okay. I remember the first, the first bit, cause I was like, okay, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm evaluating, I'm evaluating, you know, and then all of a sudden this little, this little, um, from the, the chair outside, this little, um, uh, curtain kind of thing, like it just touched me on my shoulder and I started to feel this connection to something more than my mind and my physical body. And so I was like, okay, I can sit with this. And it was so grounding. It was so beautiful. It was so, it just, 
it, it wasn't that I was losing my mind in that session. I was just not listening to it anymore. And I was like, oh gosh, isn't this refreshing? And then I just went into a lot of different things where I was feeling very healed, very, a lot of energy moved through me. I was shaking, like not in a frantic way that would scare you, but in a very gentle way that it's just like, you're just sort of like in a super scrub machine. And one of my, one of my intentions was to get a, a super cellular soul scrub. That's what I wanted, right? I wanted to just get rid of any energy in, within my cells and my body that wasn't serving me. And sure enough, that's what it did is it just, you know, shook it out. I did see some kaleidoscope and I, I was able to to see some visual things. I talked to my council. Um, you know, I, I, I think I was sitting with the Galactic Federation and at the time I didn't know what that was. And I was like, okay, I still wanted to sort of judge some of these things in my logical mind. But as we expand our consciousness, we start to understand, oh, okay, there's just so much more out there that we just aren't privy to. And so it's not for everyone and not everybody needs to know. I mean, this is I'm off on a tiny tangent here, but I think it's an important one for, for listeners who are Please. like, what is she talking about? Um, you know, expansion of consciousness, a very non-spiritual way to maybe frame this is if you're sitting in your house for your lifetime and somebody says, I'm going to put you out on a dive boat off the island of Hawaii and put you in scuba gear and scuba gear and take you down under the water, you'd go, oh my goodness, I had no idea that this existed, right? And you just like, pow, you'd be like, wow, I, I know so much more and I see so much more and I understand so much more and I had no idea that that was even available. So as I said, non-spiritual example, but expanding your consciousness and understanding that there's a lot more energy at play and there's a lot more to you than what meets the eye is what is super fun and is what makes life adventurous and there is a magic to it and there is a flow to it. So, so that was just the San Pedro part. I'm happy to talk about the other ones as well, but I just want to pause for a moment because I know I kind of went on to a lot of different tangents there. No, no, no. It, it, it was great. Uh, that, that, that was awesome. And, it, you know, it's, um, uh, it, it it mirrors, let's say, um, some of the experiences that uh, uh, I've I've chatted with other people about in terms of um, the ayahuasca and ibogaine and some you know some of the other stories uh, of awakening um, uh, when uh, first confronted with these these I'll say plant teachers. Um, it's very. It's interesting, you know, because we were discussing before the show um, that you know, and I mentioned in the bio that uh, you. In addition to everything you're doing in terms of writing and so forth, uh, you you are advising uh, some of these organizations via uh, you have a group called Psychedelic Sages and and you know it's um, these compounds uh, have for I guess since whatever since the 50s or 40s whatever it may be have resided on that sort of drug enforcement agency sort of class one list of stuff um and only in recent years with the sort of the opening of some clinical development flexibility have we seen the ls well i don't say lsd but the psilocybin and, and and some of these other compounds uh i, I talked to somebody a couple months ago about sort of high dose dextromethorphan the cough syrup for, for chronic depression and so forth. so we're sort of beginning to see um these uh, materials in one way or another sort of seep back into the We'll call the modern pharmacopoeia um and i you sort of just love to get your thoughts on what you're seeing in terms of some of these psychedelic biotech companies had some of them on the show because they're they're sort of a a wide range of views in the sense you know uh, we talk to those that are like hey we're going to create this i'll just pull it you know the psilocybin type compound that doesn't have the visionary effects but has some sort of pharmacologic effect to those that say no we need to keep the visionary effect associated with the compound to others that are like no we need to keep you in the you know to the rainforest or whatever or where you can access the spirit of the jaguar and so forth and so on so there's a kind of a broad spectrum of thought on, on where these materials should actually be going in the modern healthcare system what do you do what are you advising some of these companies on talk a little bit about this area if you would yeah. Well, I want to go back to your first question. And 
the first part of this, I think, is that right now there's a huge fear experiment going on. It, there's It's always been about fear or love in humanity on planet planet earth it's always been that it's forever and ever and forever will be but right now we've been pressed with a lot of fear-based ideas thought constructs whether it's the coronavirus um and we go back to the 60s and 70s and there was fear i mean i think anyone at a certain age remembers the ad where the egg was in the dropped in the pan and said you know this is drugs and this is your brain on drugs right i mean who who doesn't like get impacted by that and when I look back at that now, because then I'm sure that was part of my huge judgment. But what was happening back in the 60s and 70s, as people were starting to think for themselves, they were connecting in to the power of who they really are, which is a connection to source energy. And governments don't like that. People in power don't like that because you can't be manipulated. Yeah. And because you want oneness and you want wholeness for everyone, you don't want separation. So separation is the is the problem, will always be the problem, but it's as simple as remembering, remembering back to wholeness and knowing that you are source energy. So whatever you want to call source energy depends upon what, what your background is. If you want to call it God, you want to call it, you know, the universe, what, whatever, whatever word resonates for you is fine, but it's understanding the power of who you really are. And lots of organizations, agencies don't want you to know that. They want you to keep fighting to be an individual, to be somebody, to have something, to be separate from other people. And look, there is nothing wrong with being a character out there in the world and being yourself. I am always going to be Beth Bell and I'm always going to come with a, you know, a bunch of characteristics about myself, um, some that I love and some that uh, maybe not so much, but yeah, still you're going to be yourself. So it's not like you're losing yourself, but you know who you are from the most powerful place of inner knowing and accessing your inner wisdom every single day day so that you're not being spun around by the chaos of the external world. So that I just feel like I wanted to say is the foundational element. And I have a feeling that you're on the same soapbox with me um, that, you know, it is a fear experiment. And, and now is the time for people to wake up. It is only going to get crappier out there. It's going to get more complicated. It's going to get more chaotic. Um, there's a lot of deflectors like religion and politics and crazy stuff that and are just social media. <laughs> <laughs> Social media, they're all distractors and they're all mind viruses. I'm not saying that you can't be part of them. I'm not, I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying it's time to wake up, people. It's time to wake up. And what that means is you need to start expanding your consciousness and understand the energies that are at play and take your freedom back. Take your mind back because the devil is in the mind. The devil isn't out there. He's not holding a pitchfork. You know, it's it's through the people that we call into our lives. It's through the situations that we call into our lives that make us doubt who we really are, that make us doubt why we're really here. That's the devil. And the devil is in your mind. So, but God is in your mind. The, you know, the, the, the opposite is in your mind too. So it's all about unraveling the mind. And so with that said, to go to your next set of questions, um, you know, where do I see this? And, and one of the reasons why the podcast Psychedelic Sages got started was um, there's some people out there, some companies out there that are simply wanting to maximize profits for mental health. Yeah. It's free commerce. You can do whatever you want. Uh, you know, that's fine. But I want people to feel inspired to invest their money in companies who are who have the greater intention to really help people. And so there's a lot of dog and pony shows. There's a lot of people, you know, trying to patent mother nature. And I get it. I get it. I know it. I know from profitability. I know from being in big pharma. I know from having uniqueness, you know, unique selling propositions. There, I'm not saying there's something wrong with that. I'm just saying that for me, I feel like I'm here to help people get in touch with plant-based medicines. They don't always have to be plant-based. Like I had a big judgment in the beginning. Oh, I'll only do things that are plant-based, you know, that are from nature. And then you realize, no, you know, the people and the chemists that develop these, these other molecules in laboratories, MDMA and LSD, that those are all still coming from source. Those individuals downloaded formulas to come up with these, with these molecules that are here to help humanity. 
That's how it works, you know? Yep. So, so I got over that judgment and, um, but I still have a huge, huge thing that we need to have discernment and because there is a lot of stuff at play. And so another part of what I feel like I'm called to do is to help people have discernment in going into these sessions. So, um, I get that, that some of the companies are taking and, and rightly so some of the molecules and trying to make them very specific because it's, it's, it's the way to, to get FDA approval. It's the way to go after certain, certain disease states, um, behavior modifications, you know, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, um, the full spectrum of each plant, I, I still believe is, is, is the, I hate to say the word best, but I would say it's, it's what nature's offering you. So if you have the opportunity to do that, I think that's, that's great. Um, but I also believe that some of these other molecules that are being very, you know, finely tweaked are going to be a good stepping stone for some people who aren't ready to really fully step in. So I'm all for microdosing, mini dosing and macro dosing because some people aren't ready to step in and just like let it because because people don't want to change, right? They want they want their life to be different, but they don't want to change anything. And it's, it's like no, people we have to let go of the old programs and the old ideations. It they're programs that got installed when you were a young person on the planet because your parents most likely tried their very best to do everything they could right, but they came with their own set of programs from their own parents. And all of those programs separate you from your own inner knowing. And so this is all about getting people back to their inner knowing, their inner wisdom and embodying it so that we can have a better, a better humanity, a better planet, a better experience with this life and earth walk, um, you know, in earth school. And so, yeah, I'm not necessarily going to say that I'm for or against any particular thing. I think it's the energy behind the company. And I, 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 I'm, constantly questioning the the executives of what's your why what are you doing it for and mm -hmm. that tells me where i want to invest my money and i want to tell others hey this may be where you want to invest your money if you have money to invest right? Right. right like if you want to actually to put put it forth to to help these products come to the marketplace so there's some people who have really gotten into a a, a different ideation around why they're doing it. And it's about money. And again, that's going to, that is, that is how the world works. Um, but I just want to support the ones that are more doing it for helping humanity because unfortunately insurance and the way that the pharmaceutical industry works, it is, we need to have them come back over and over and over again to be profitable because it yeah. takes so much money to acquire a patient in that we need to keep them coming back to take more. And the nice thing about psychedelics is that it's uh, not, it's not always, but a lot of times it's a one and done. It can yeah. be a one and done for people. If you, you know, macro dose, it can be a one and done depending upon what you're looking to do. Um, for many people, it's not so, but I'm just saying that it's, yeah, the insurance and, and all of the, the, the constructs of how that industry works pushes all of these guys that may have come in with the intention of awakening and healing humanity into a box to do it in a way that works to be profitable, to get investors, to have the biggest, strongest, fastest growing company. And I'm just saying like, let's take a step back. Let's, let's stick with why you're doing this. Cause I think a good handful of them, the founders have done medicines and that's what came, that's how they came up with, with wanting to start the company. That's where the the fire and the drive came, but I'll tell you about for a lot of them somewhere along the way, they get really off of that. And yeah. for, for various. So, um, yeah, so there's a, 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 I mean, a big, long discussion, um, around that, that we could probably have for hours and hours. Um, if we got really specific about the molecules, but that's, I guess, where I feel right now, um, when it comes to big pharma and them coming in and, and of course, we know that big pharma is going to come and start buying up some of these smaller companies, and then that will change the dynamic and the model and all of that as well. And I would really like to see these these companies that have a lot going on for themselves to be independent 
because they, they will be, if they sell out for the money, then we're in a different situation. There's not a lot of big pharma companies because they're all on the stock exchanges and they're all, you know, it's all about profitability. Yeah. So that energy, it's, it's a clash. It doesn't yep. mean it can't work. Um, big pharma is going to do great things for psychedelics in some ways, because it's going to spend the money. It's going to do the consumer awareness. It's going to make things feel more normal. If some, if a company like Bayer or Johnson and Johnson suddenly had a psychedelic, well, that changes everything, doesn't it? Right. You know, cause then people go, Oh, well, that's the aspirin company. Oh, that's the baby company. You know, that gives it credibility. So I'm saying there are good things for big pharma um, to come in on this. It's just, again, the energy and the intention behind it, because that's, that's where we need to stay in our true North. I, I I appreciate your take on all that. It's yeah, it, I agree. It's going to be. I mean, I agree with you completely on, on in, in terms of the background approach to uh, to to these materials. But it's going to be interesting to see what settles out. And, you know, when the first couple of these make their way through phase three or get to yeah. registration, and, and ultimately what happens there in the direction the companies decide to take things in. Um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a fascinating time on that front. Um, yeah. But what? Um, Say a few words, if you would, about uh, intuitive risk taking um, as yeah. part of spiritual awakening. Um, I'm, I, I read some materials in this area as well, and I just like you to uh, to walk us a little through where the 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 place that intuition uh, plays um, yeah. in you know, our daily life. Well, intuitive risk taking is something that I started utilizing several years ago, and basically what it is is if I get a hit, and when I say a hit, I mean that I'm probably going about my day doing something and an idea drops in sort, sort of out of nowhere, like not within the context of something that I'm doing. And I'm like, oh gosh. And it makes me feel like, ah, I have energy around that. Like that, mm, that seems interesting. And I go, oh, okay. Let me just, let me just feel into that. I don't run off right away and, you know, and do it. Um, and then I say, show me if, there's validity to this. Like, is this a place that I really need to, to put my time and my effort? And I, I usually look for at least three validators, three things that come and say, yes, this is, and, and they're random. It's like the more random, the better, right? Because I believe at that point, what you're doing is you're getting around the mind. Because I'll tell you, if you come up with a big idea, your mind will come fast and furious to tell you all the reasons why you can't accomplish it. Mm -hmm. it, it won't work. And if your mind doesn't do it, your family and friends that love you the most will tell you, right? Like, it's impossible. So um, intuitive risk taking is like, oh, no, I feel it in here. I feel I feel this. And I've been validated by my external environment that says, yeah, this is something I want to do. And then I take the jump. And the reason why I say, I guess, intuitive is that, you know, the hardest part, at least for me, was always, if I do this, then X, Y, or Z could happen. And I got programmed early on that you make a decision and it works it's your fault. You make a decision and it doesn't work. It's your fault. So my deep inner self accountability was kind of a double edged sword for me where it could be really paralyzing because you're like, Oh, but if I make a mistake, it's my fault, you know, but, Oh, but if I, but if it works, it's my fault. So uh, the intuitive risk taking was just a way that really helped me to say, I don't need to explain the answer to anyone. It's probably not going to make sense to anyone that I decided to up my life and quit my job in the middle of a divorce and move to Costa Rica. You know, like I don't need to answer to anybody about that because I know nope. within me that that's something that my soul said I wanted and decided to do, and I'm going to keep going. And I think another thing that's really important for, for me as I've exercised my intuitive risk-taking is realizing that we don't need to judge ourselves and think that we make a mistake. We make another choice. And when we think we make a mistake, and I'm not saying there's things that we wouldn't regret or we wouldn't reflect back on and say, yeah, I wish I would have done something different. I'm just saying, just don't focus on what you would have done different. Just do something different, mm -hmm. you know, move, move the needle forward. And, and so that's really the intuitive risk-taking part. And I think that a lot of people, you know, have a lot of woulda, shoulda, couldas, and I just want to inspire people to, to do it and have your own foundation, whatever works for you as to how you can go about making decisions. If, you know, if my my idea works for you to get three validated hits and then you feel strong enough inside to say, I'm going to make this decision despite what other people are going to probably try to project onto me or say to me afterwards. And as you read, I mean, some of the things I've done, like 
they haven't been the biggest successes. Um, and some of the things have been really big successes. And so it's really about how do we recover from them? Yep. And I like to always talk about blissfully neutral states, right? So you can achieve this great level of enlightenment or awakening or consciousness. Um, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get stuff thrown at you. It probably chances are you're going to get more thrown at you and it's going to be bigger challenges and it's going to make you feel bad some days and it's going to make you feel great other days, but it's how do I get myself back into that blissfully neutral state? You know, that place where I can just be really good with who I am and where I'm at and not let everybody else in my external environment spin me. And that's, mm. that's, that's the place where, you know, peace passes all understanding and keeps our hearts and minds open. Now you did ask me about Bufo, which is five MEO DMT. And, and I don't want to skip that. Cause I think that's a really fun one. Mm -hmm. um, so it is kind of like the extreme of extremes. And so the fact that I did that after a San Pedro was also a bit interesting because as I, as you heard me say, I have a lot of discernment and da, 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 da. Well, a friend of mine was going to to do a ceremony and um, and I thought to myself, you know, I think I should just offer to go and hold the space for her. I just feel like, you know, I can just wait outside, but I just, I just feel like I want to be there. This is a big deal, you know? And, and, um, and then spirit said, I said, well, maybe I should just offer that to her. And then spirit said, just stay out of it. Just let it flow. Like if you're supposed to, you, you will. And if not, and so I, I didn't say anything. And, you know, she came back around like 15 minutes later and she goes, you know, I was just thinking, you know, would you be willing to come and sit with me when I, when I go do the Bufo ceremony? And I said, sure. So I was like, okay, validation. I go. So I went and, and sat with her and it was, yeah, an amazing experience for her 15 minutes. And, and, you know, she, I think the only word she said was, oh shit at one point. And then <laughs> she got up and she said, I feel like I just spoke to God, um, which of course intrigued me. And she was up off the floor in 15 minutes. And, and then we were all talking and, you know, I was getting to know the server and, and the individuals in the room and, and who they are and their energies. And just felt like everybody was really from a place of pureness and felt comfortable with them. And then of course they said, are you interested? Cause we're done for the day and we, we can, we can add another ceremony. And I was like, oh, this wasn't what I was expecting. And so I said, yeah. I mean, that was probably an interesting time for me because I didn't use my validation system, um, you know, in my more traditional sense. But of course, I was using my discernment and my validation system. I was I was profiling everybody in the room from the moment I walked in, right? Because I was there with my friend and I was I was holding the space for her and wanting to make sure that this was safe and sacred. So um yeah, I had the most incredible experience. It was it was a complete ego death. People go, what does that mean? It means that uh, after one puff, uh, you you for me and for everyone, it pretty much just passes out, which sounds super scary, and it is honestly when you're there. But um, I just they just helped me lay back, and I went through this moment of absolute terror, thinking that I'm I, I'm dying. Oh my God, what are my parents going to think? I've done drugs. I should have never done this. Oh, I've, I've just, you know, stepped over the line. It was like the freakiest thing ever. And then I just like, it was as though someone poured acid all over my body and my mind. And I was completely disintegrated completely. And in the most blissful place place that one could ever imagine. It was absolute oneness with God. It is something that I think every minister should experience. I know that's a big statement, but I do. You don't know God until you have experienced God. You can read about God. You can talk about God, but until you actually release yourself from your mind. And of course we, we want our minds. We're functioning here on this earth. So there's nothing wrong with having a mind, but if you get a break from your mind and you get to experience the oneness of, of God, I'll use, I'll use the word God. But as I said before, whatever that is for you, um, that place of oneness, that source energy, you come back going, that is my true North. And that is what I want to achieve in my life. And that's where the work starts because that's where you have to start to really just see, okay, I know where I want to go in being pure in this lifetime and exuding that love and that oneness to others, but I'm still going to be the character Beth Bell. 
right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not changing necessarily like the fact that I'm Beth Bell. I'm, I'm changing my perception and my lens on the world. And that is so important to get out of the mind, to step out of that, that paradigm, um, even momentarily. And then you spend the rest of your life, you know, reaching that expanded state of consciousness in your everyday normal life, because our minds are great, but our minds are also the devil. Yeah. So you gotta, you gotta make the choice. If you're going to let your, your, your ego mind rule you. And I suggest you put that in the back seat and you let your soul drive. And that's really the whole point of the book. And I just feel like I'm the most unlikely candidate to have done psychedelics. And so I feel like I want to be that, that, I want to be that shifter. We got to shift the narrative around psychedelics. Um, they're not for everyone at all points in time. It's something that I think needs to be a very intentional decision for people. So kind of back to your question about pharma, you know, yeah, there's some good stepping stones that I think, you know, some micro dosing, some mini dosing, um, all of those things start to get us into out of the, you know, what, what, what fires together, wires together. So whatever thoughts, you know, are firing together, they're wiring together. You know, Joe Dispenza has been adamant about, about helping us understand that. Um, and what we see with psychedelics is the neuroplasticity yep. is a big deal. And why would we not want to get back to have Having all engines firing and pathways firing so that we do understand our un unlimited possibilities. Why do we want to stay so ingrained, you know, in this, in this one road or this one way that we've learned and that everybody around us reflected and, you know, that's the conscious collective and, and it's not moving in a loving direction right now. I think most people could <laughs> that they've experienced that. So, yeah. So we want to get more people moving on the, the loving direction so that we can help our brothers and sisters out and, you know, and live in a better world that is about happiness and love, not fear and destruction. Absolutely. Very, very timely message for 2022, no doubt. Uh, really, really fascinating, Beth. What, um, what's coming up? Um, what's happening for the rest of the year with you? Uh, what are you doing in 2023? Um, anything else that's happening? Uh, that uh, I'm gonna obviously in the in the bio I'll put links to to your website and everything. But um, anything else we should know about where we could follow you, maybe run into you at some point and meet you? Um, please take the floor if I've missed anything. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting because I do really enjoy um, consulting work with CEOs specifically in the psychedelic pharmaceutical sector. So I'm still focused on that, but I feel a huge pull because I've had such incredible, I feel so blessed, uh, incredible feedback from the book. It's really done its job. I mean, I had three main goals with it. One is to help inspire people to take re responsibility for their own life. The second is to blow up trauma that they've experienced in their life. And the third is to help shift the narrative around psychedelics. And I feel like through all of the comments that I've received, the reviews on Amazon, that it's doing that. But then a lot of people say, oh, you were so inspiring. I'm just afraid that I'm going to, I'm going to just go back to my old life. And I was like, oh no, you know, like, how can I help more? Like, how can I help more? How can I bring people through the process to really jump in and be inspired? Don't wait for the big, you know, trauma, tragedy, accident, health condition, you know, divorce, what, whatever, whatever it may be. Don't wait for those things. Like, you know, get, get on this now. And so, um, I've started a, a new thing that's about to launch and it's, it's a, it's a, the bliss book club. And okay. what it is is people can sign up for a membership. And when they do, they'll get a uh, eight week series of emails. Um, they can watch a, a VIP, uh, one hour discussion where I've, I have a, a small book club, this VIP book club, where we talk about three chapters at a time. I share more detailed insights about what, what was happening at that time in my life, some extra tips, tools, and techniques. And then um, each each week I will have on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, which is up and coming, um, live sessions where people can come in, ask questions, uh, ask questions about the book, ask questions about life, uh, and that we can really start to help in pollinating the planet with love uh, and help with the he healing and awakening of humanity. The other thing is I put together the book, um, the handbook, Awakening, Healing and Awakening Handbook, so mm -hmm. that people could understand some of some of the terminology because everybody's in a different spot on their journey. So that gives people 
greater definitions about some of the concepts I talk about, more insights and background about some of the healing modalities. Um, so that was really intended to just help people get them through that spirituality 101, 102, you know, 110, right? Just to, to help as a, as a resource. And then the, the five pearls of wisdom workbook is it helps people just go, well, wait, wait, there's a lot here. You know, where do I focus? Where do, you know, and that's so individual. And so, yeah, people can really can figure that out. So I would say it's my YouTube channel, which is Beth Bell Live. I'll be starting um, those live sessions. Uh, people can can um, use the QR code on the book, and it should take you to a VIP page where you can get access to the to the book club. So yeah, it's it's going to be really about. <laughs> awakening and healing humanity, you know, one discussion at a time that is a one-to-one, -one but goes out one-to-many, right? Where we can just help, we can help pollinate the planet with love on a much bigger scale, the butterfly effect. We know how this happens. And I mean, who doesn't want a little bit more love in their life? Absolutely. Absolutely. No, it's a, it's, it's an awesome message. It's an awesome journey you've been on, Beth. I just, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating listening to you and just going to, personally continue to follow everything you're up to um for uh again for everybody that's uh, going to be listening to this episode of the show uh, across the various podcast networks or watching on our youtube channel again you've been listening to beth bell author advisor entrepreneur uh focused on pollinating the planet with love um check out uh well definitely get a copy of angels herpes and psychedelics unraveling the mind to unveil illusions also check out our other titles awakening and healing handbook five pearls of wisdom workbook if you go to bali check out the insider's guide to Abud, um and then be on the lookout for uh the bliss book club and uh, beth bell live on youtube uh, bethbell.me is her website and we'll be putting that uh, in the bio of the show as well um, Beth I, I want to thank you again for taking time out of your schedule to come talk to us about this fascinating journey obviously uh, thank you for sharing the wisdom and as we say on our show thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow via uh, interesting uh, the audience and in, in the world in, in spiritual awakening and, and thinking beyond uh what we just see in front of us every day. So real, really fascinating story and really wish you the best of all of it. Thank you. And thank you for all you're doing to help awaken and heal humanity through this show. So I much appreciate our time together. Great seeing you.